And in just a few months, the new coronavirus that emerged from the Chinese city of Wuhan has spread around the world. As it spreads, scientists and researchers are striving to quickly develop ways of fighting the disease. Computer modelling is being used to track its transmission, while virologists are attempting to engineer a vaccine. Joining us live now is infectious disease researcher Nigel McMillan from Griffith University. Appreciate your time, Nigel. Where are we at today? We're getting a lot of data through. Is it correct that the death rate now is starting to slow? When do you think we can expect the number of actual cases to begin to subside? Yeah, I think in the eight weeks that we've known about this virus, we can see now 1,000 deaths and 42,000 plus cases. There's some hint that the rate of uh, infection in China is starting to slow down. So I think in the next two weeks, this will be the tipping point to see where this actually goes. Uh, all the cases that are outside of China have been from China, so we have a, or, or a few local transmissions. Um, but I think the next two weeks is really going to tell us where we're going to go with this, with this pandemic. The World Health Organization has said that it believes the vaccine is at least 18 months away. What is the process to, to even get to that point? Well, I guess we have to choose a candidate uh, vaccine. So these can be based on proteins. Uh, there are a number of efforts going on, including one in Australia, to develop this. And this has to be produced. So production of vaccine is not trivial. And then tested. And we have to test them in animals to see that it uh, works and it actually protects. And then we have to test it in humans to see it's safe. That process normally takes quite a long time. 18 months is probably perhaps conservative if we really want to rush this through. Um, but we should be able to produce a candidate in the next four months and then we'll be on to testing. And that's what the next 12 months after that will probably take. People right around the world are understandably worried about this virus. Yesterday, the Chief Medical Officer here in Australia declared that there's no need for people on the streets here to wear masks. Are masks, help, masks helpful in other situations, on international flights, for example, or are they actually pretty useless in terms of preventing being infected by the virus? Well, unless you have an incredibly expensive mask, masks won't stop a virus being breathed in. Viruses are just too small. Mostly masks stop you infecting yourself when you shake someone's hand or touch an infected door handle. Uh, you touch your nose or your mouth and you infect yourself. So there's, there's some use in that situation. But what the Chief Health Officer is talking about is that the virus is not spreading around in our community in Australia. So there's no need to not go to events where there are crowds. There's no need to wear a mask because there's no virus spreading around to actually be stopped anyway. Uh, if you want to wear them on planes, there's no particular problem with that, but they're not actually that useful. The government will decide a bit later this week as to whether or not to continue the ban on flights from China. Knowing what you know about the spread of this virus, do you think there's any chance those flights should resume, or is that barrier crucial to continue keeping the virus out of Australia? Yeah, we know in our arsenal or our toolkit of stopping the virus spreading, this isolation of individuals is what's worked very well for us in Australia. And the Chinese authority have made Herculean efforts to stop the spread and it looks like it's starting to pay off. My own personal opinion is that they will probably continue the flight ban for another week or two. But you're going to eventually have to make a choice. Now, if there's, in two weeks' time we start to see that rate go down, we know we're starting to win the battle. and then that consideration of opening the borders back up may occur. But if it's going up then and it starts spreading around the world, and we see now in Singapore more than half the cases are actually local spread rather than imported from China, once it starts to get to that stage then flight bans actually don't make sense. Professor, the World Health Organization just overnight has renamed this virus COVID-19. Was there a reason for that? Does it really matter what it's called? I think novel coronavirus was pretty sort of uh, difficult to, to say in some ways and I think that's probably a good name. It was going to be Wuhan coronavirus or as I said they've come up with COVID-19. Um, I think they've just needed a, a proper name and they've come up with one. And how does this compare to SARS? We keep using that as the touch point. Where are we at in terms of the, the comparisons between the two viruses? Uh, so this virus is quite different. So SARS we learnt about quite late uh, and it got out of China and through Hong Kong and particularly into Canada uh, and caused uh, a number of deaths, 800 deaths or so. But it spread much more slowly. This virus seems to be much more infectious. We think that patients are probably starting to spread the virus around when they're asymptomatic 
And so this makes this much more difficult because, you know, why would you isolate someone who's not sick? Uh, and yet they're spreading the virus around. And we've seen a couple of cases uh, from, uh, from China, from, um, from Britain, where you have these so-called super spreaders who uh, seem to be quite infectious and spread the virus around to, to people quite readily. Professor Nigel McMillan, we do appreciate your insights and uh, sharing your knowledge with us on that. Thank you so much for your time on Newsday this afternoon. You're welcome.